It was 81, I was trying to leave the war behind, looking for peace and a place I could store my mind in the forest pond. This is the Art of G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero. This is the Omnibus Hardcover Edition. We previously did softcover editions from 2015 to 2018, sold out of those in a year and a half. We did not have product on 3D Joes for two or three years, which really created a lot of pent up demand for ultimately what we ended up coming out with. I'm a big person, that's a big hand. This is a bigger book. This is 13 and a half inches wide by 14 and a half inches tall. So the first thing you're gonna get when you open this up, this is called an in sheet. And this basically attaches the first signature to the hardcover itself. So we thought it was a really cool nod to why this artwork matters. We got submissions from the backers and from across the interwebs of guys and gals of our generation enjoying their G.I. Joes at Christmas. This is why the art of G.I. Joe, a real American hero is so special and why it still bonds all of us because of those timeless memories that we have from when we were children opening this stuff up. So thank you to every one of you that submitted your photos for these in sheets. I think it's a very special way to open and close the book. So you'll see the closing one probably in a couple hours here. All right, here's the opening credits. Uh, this was created obviously by 3D Joes and licensed by Hasbro. The first uh, credits are who did the majority of the work. Then there's credits to the creators that were interviewed in the making of this book. And then there's a bunch of thank yous to people that have contributed assets to 3D Joes and to the book. Thank you guys so much. There's also special thanks to the folks that have given a significant chunk of their time to helping build 3D Joes for the enrichment of the hobby for all of us. Thank you guys, and you'll see your names in print there. Then we get these opening, now these are called interludes in the hardcover because they're not forwards. Now originally Kirk Bazigian provided six of these for all six of the softcover issues. You will see those peppered throughout the book and they are called interludes. Here is the first one, it's a forward because it is the forward of the book, but every time after this when you see Kirk's signature and you see Kirk's insight, it'll be referred to as an interlude and it will come between years. All right, so before we kick off the 1982 figures, I, I have a really short uh, introduction of what we've been working on, collecting, documenting, restoring, and presenting the art of G.I. Joe, a real American hero. Then we get into the figures. Now, every figure section is gonna have a splash page like this. Every vehicle section is gonna have a splash page like this. This is the final product, you guys. Your book is gonna look just like this. This is basically the first one to come off the press. This is a final engineering pilot. This shows you what your book is gonna look like. There's no turning back now. These are being mass produced. They're being shipped to me. They'll get here in December. And I just could not be happier that we're at this point. So I hope you guys are happy with it too. We obviously added all the file cards this go around. So that was a, a huge addition. For each year, we talk about the different card backs that were available. So everybody knows we had nine backs and then 11 backs in 1982. We also had the Cobra Commander offer promo here. And so I'll talk about the sequence of that stuff. I'll also talk about commentary from Ron Rudat or Mark Pennington as to why they uh, came up with the characters that they came up with. Now, G.I. Joe was originally the nine characters. We didn't have an enemy. Now, Marvel sat down with Hasbro, reviewed their pitch deck, and said, who are they going to fight? You guys have probably all heard this story. So they uh, came up with Cobra. And this was Archie Goodwin that recommended it, potentially because of Hydra, who was a Captain America foe. So Cobra became the enemy, and these two figures were rushed into production. Cobra Commander was also produced, but they held him for the first Flag Points promotion. And then you'll get into an unadorned art section. So we've got Stalker, we've got Zap, we've got four additional figures. Now here's where the book, I think, gets really, really special. So you have the To the Rescue poster, and you have the Stars and Stripes Forever poster, and that's on a pullout spread. I'm not gonna reformat uh, the camera every time we get to one of these, but I can try to pull this down a little bit this way. Okay, so as you can see, this is the first gatefold spread. It's a natural segue into Ron Rudat because Ron Rudat actually painted the Stars and Stripes Forever poster. So you get to the rescue and you get the Stars and Stripes Forever, which were the 1982 Mel Order poster, and then, you open that double gatefold up, and I can't even show all this, guys. That is one gatefold. It's Ron Rudat's process for designing figures and designing vehicles. He didn't just do figures, he also did vehicles. He also did the entire process for documenting these things for engineering, so the 360 turnarounds, the figure reference system. They were building this plane in the air, 
1981. This had not been done at Hasbro prior, and so Ron had to come up with a lot of that. So I thought it was important for the first double gatefold spread to show the primary figure designer from 1982 to 1986. This is 54 inches across, 14 and a half inches tall, 54 inches across. Four pages dedicated to Ron Rudette, the godfather of G.I. Joe, the designer of the Crowbar symbol. Most of you know a lot about him. If you don't, just type in 3D Joe's Ron Rudette and you'll see an amazing creator profile that I worked very hard with Mr. Rudette to put together. He also illustrated this book. So we go ahead and share that book. And so I'll just go ahead and tuck away. Now you can see with these double gatefolds, anytime you see these two arrows, that means it's time to open up and enjoy. All right, so that's the first double gatefold spread. There's 11 of those throughout the book. All right, then we talk about Toy Fair and how it was a mad dash to get ready for Toy Fair. The figure packaging is actually the paintings by Hector Garrido here, but all these vehicles are marker comps. As you can see, one of the marker comps right here, that's from the 1982 Toy Fair catalog. They continued to use marker comps for years that followed, and so I've, I've shown a couple of those. They often featured prototype figures and vehicles in the Toy Fair catalog because the final manufactured specimens were not ready. All right, so now we get into the 1982 vehicles, and I'm gonna slide this over again. And so you have a splash page here. This is the 1982 Vamp. I had the very distinct honor of being able to purchase that piece a while back. That was incredible. Um, so then we get into all the vehicles, and what's new about this over the soft covers is we have very lightly opaque blueprints in the background to fill up this area right here and also tell that part of the story. So when possible, you'll be able to read all the features of the jump for example. All right, so then I'll shoot through the vehicle section. Every single vehicle is featured. Every vehicle that has a pilot or a driver has the file card featured. And then we get into sections like this where we talk about the shrinkage that they did in 1982. So there were some legal concerns that the packaging was a little too big on a few products. So they ended up shrinking those packages. We also get some unadorned artwork. And then we get into licensing. So licensing was actually handled by Nell Yamtov, Nelson Yamtov. He goes by Nell. He worked at Marvel in their licensing department. Marvel did Hasbro's licensing for G.I. Joe from 1982 to 1994. So you see a lot of letterhead out there, Marvel Comics Group. There's the man right there. We did a nice interview with him. He's a wonderful, brilliant guy, super fun to talk to. I think we talked for like three hours. It was great. All right, so then you'll get all the licensed product, anything that featured unique artwork, it will be featured in this book. So every single piece of painted artwork from 1982 to 1994, plus some of the canceled and unreleased stuff, it's all in this 712 page book. Now this was a brilliant lunchbox by Thermos. The line art was provided by Kirk Bazigian. He loved it so much that he reached out to his connection at Thermos and got permission to contact the illustrator. And that's how we ended up with the To the Rescue poster that I've already shown you that ended up being the 1983 catalog art. So that's the same artist that created this Thermos lunchbox. All right, then we have the 1982 collector case illustration in its entirety. So like I was telling you, we featured a close up earlier. Now you get the whole piece. You see the arrows here. So that tells us that it is time to open up to this double gatefold spread. Now this introduces you to Ed Morrill, who was in charge of branding and packaging from 1969 to 1989. He was actually an external firm, packaging firm out of Manhattan. And he came on and he hired Don Stivers and they created all the artwork for the adventure team. So 19, if you're a fan of G.I. Joe from 1970 to 1976, you're a fan of Ed Morrill, you're a fan of Don Stivers, and you'll learn all about him on those two pages. The reason I introduced him in this book was because he also was in charge of G.I. Joe, a real American hero, and the launch of uh, the branding of that, the launch of that, the hiring of the illustrators, the managing of the illustrators. And so we introduce, you know, the decisions that they made around the relaunch. And of course we introduce Hector Garrido. And this photograph was provided by his granddaughter who had fond memories of visiting him in his studio in Connecticut. It's really an honor to be able to connect with her. And uh, thank you again for providing that photograph. So this is uh, in tribute to Hector Garrido, those couple pages. And then if you turn the page over, this is Hector Garrido's work from the 1970s on a book called The Baroness. So I am basically positing that the explosion background's roots are based in Hector's earlier work. Now it's a more photorealistic explosion with some chunks coming out of it. It looks like people could be hurt by it. And Kirk Bizigan said they actually, focus group tested something like that first and then they ended up making it a more artistic abstract explosion so that it didn't look so dangerous. Um, then we have a nice little tribute. 
to Mr. Garrido. Uh, this is written by Ed Morrill, who hired and managed him throughout the process. And we explain kind of the end of the era for CLS and M, Coleman, LaPuma, Siegel, and Morrill, which was the packaging firm uh, in 1989. They basically kind of ended that relationship with Hasbro. Now, Hector Garrido would continue to be hired as a contract illustrator through the end of the line, 1994. Now, the voice of a real American hero is Kirk Bazigian. So for the first couple years, Kirk came from copywriting originally. And so Kirk was the voice of G.I. Joe. If you read any of the newsletters, most of the call out text on the packaging, that's all Kirk Bazigian. And so if you're reading G.I. Joe related products for the first couple of years, you're, you're, really, you're really listening to Kirk Bazigian. All right, so this is Airborne, Unadorned Art, uh, Torpedo. This is a scanned from the original painting by Hector Garrido. Shout out to Sam. Love you, man. Thank you so much. You made this book so much better. Uh, this is the 1983 figure section. And so I'll just shoot through this really quick. You guys already know what all this is. It's just the figures and the file cards beautifully, meticulously restored. And then a walkthrough of the different types of card backs. There was explosion card backs and there was normal card backs. There was a major blood promotion that came out with a postcard that was a bit controversial because you had to cut the faces off the front of the cards instead of using the flag points. And that was a diabolical plan by Kirk Bazigian to get the stuff that was peg warming in the spring of 1983 off the pegs to make room for the swivel arm stuff. So that was very intentional. A uh, letter that was sent by Hasbro to parents that were wondering why their kids had to buy these things again to cut the faces off of them. So we document all that kind of stuff in detail and it's based on creator interviews. Now we're into the unadorned art section for 1983. I'll try to shoot through this. Torpedo pre-production art, torpedo proof card, torpedo unadorned painting. Beautiful stuff. Now I wanted to talk about cartoon artwork. And so we were lucky to get our hands on the original promotional folder from Sunbow and it had beautiful art by Doug Wildey in it. So many of you probably have not seen these illustrations before. You've seen this one because it was on the newsletter, but these two are much more rare. And so it was very cool to get some Doug Wildey artwork in there and to explain how that came about. Now here is the G.I. Joe miniseries press kit folder cover. And you'll recognize that artwork because it was utilized for the Aviva diecast vehicles. And then also again in the 1983 Toy Fair catalog. So this became a kind of ubiquitous image, obviously based upon the G.I. Joe number one opening splash page. So this is a, a double gatefold spread. Again, if you see these arrows, you just grab them and open them and enjoy. So this is the cartoon section. You get a poster. This is from the 1985 press kit folder for the cartoon. The layouts have been modified where appropriate for optimal flow. Thank you to Chad for working so hard on that spread. It's funny, you remember every hour of work that went into this. This was a poster from the G.I. Joe Mobile Strike Force team newsletter. Uh, so when you signed up to be part of that club, you got a poster and that was a poster that came with it. So obviously we're transitioning into comic book art there. So we get a collecting comic art blurb. This was a poster that came with the G.I. Joe Mobile Strike Force team. If you signed up in 1982, you got that poster, and obviously that's the cover of G.I. Joe number one. Now, Kirk Bazigian shared some marker comps of G.I. Joe number one. So you can see a couple of possibilities that were pitched. Kirk Bazigian still owns these. Then you can see a very rough draft marker comp here. We also show all the newsletters that Kirk wrote, and uh, there's another poster for the 1984 one. So this is kind of the cartoon section that blossoms into the comic book section that blossoms into the kind of fan club stuff. So kind of grouping all that together for 1983. All right, now we wanna talk about some of the ubiquitous artwork that was featured all across different mediums in 1982. And the reason for that, according to Nell Yomtov, who again was the licensing executive at Marvel that was in charge of licensing for Hasbro, he said that they had a very small press kit to release and included in that was the first two issues of G.I. Joe. So naturally people attached to the comic book cover and they attached to that glorious opening full page spread and they recreated it for their purposes for the collector display case or for the mini series press kit or for the accessory battle pack. That's a painting by Garrido based on G.I. Joe number one. It was used on the display case and then it was used on the accessory pack. It obviously influenced Ron Rudat to do an Iwo Jima of his own and the Sunbow miniseries. And also the Thermos Lunchbox recreated it yet again in painted form, but this is a completely different painting by a different artist. So there were these kind of ubiquitous images across the brand for the first couple years. And really that was because they didn't have much of a press kit to send out at the time. All right, so now we get into the 1983 vehicles and I, I should mention that all the catalogs that show the vehicles are shown on the vehicle overview spreads. So several of you asked if the catalogs were gonna be included, they are. 
and they're included on the vehicle overview spreads. Again, in the black areas here, you get blueprints for the fang here, you know, follow it down and follow this up. You see the, you have the box and then you have the title and then you have the blueprints. You have the box, you have the title, and then you have the blueprints. So that's the flow. If you're ever trying to find your place in this book, this is your index. This is your years, 1983 is what we're on, and it goes through 1995. And then over here is in more detail, 1983, we finished the figures, we finished the unadorned, we finished the pre-production, we finished the cartoon and comic art, now we're in the vehicle section. So if you ever wanna figure out like kind of where you are, here's your year over here, and here's where you are within that year over here. This is a massive book and I wanted you guys to be able to find your footing really quickly. So that was our strategy for that. All right, so these are the 1983 vehicles. This is the hardest one to find by far. I think it was only out there for that, that one year and it's a very hard vehicle to find in nice condition uh, with the box. All right, so now we're in the unadorned art section for the 1983 vehicles. We'll turn that over. We see our two arrows again and we open that up. So I was so lucky uh, to connect with a former employee of Tyco and they created the train set that you guys all know by Bart Doe. And they also created the trucking set and I was able to get my hands on those. So I do artist profiles throughout this book. Anytime there's a major contributor, I try to break down kind of their career history, how they interfaced with GI Joe and what else they created throughout their careers because these are extremely talented artists that touched many more brands than just GI Joe. They also, there was a lot of them that, were, that have military history. So Bart Dove served in World War II and he uh, delivered a drawing to General Patton in 1945. Like, how crazy is that? It's amazing. Okay, so that's the train set that was released in 1983. And then here's the trucking set that was released in 1984. And the reason we have these resources that are this beautiful is because I literally was able to purchase this painting for $7,000. And that would not have happened had we not been building 3D Joes and doing the soft covers and people are, people just found us, you know, because of our passion for this, that's years and years running now. And we were able to connect with these very amazing resources. So here is the licensed peripheral products from 1983. Some really cool stuff in there. So when you're closing up these double gatefold spreads, just remember to close them back inward the way that you opened them. So put these two arrows back together. My concern is that, you know, people will turn this over and then try to fold it back that way. And that's not the way you want to go with it. What you want to do is make sure you put the arrows back together. All right. So now we're moving on. That's the, the end of the license section. Obviously, you can see the whole thing runs together, a uh, giant two-page spread. Again, that's 27 inches across, 14 and a half inches tall. So now we're gonna get into the Marvel publishing. So Marvel, they weren't just successful with the comic books. They created a bunch of books. And Earl Norm was the primary illustrator for those, and we are very lucky to have as much G.I. Joe Earl Norm artwork as we do. So I wanted to introduce Earl Norm, talk about him a little bit, before I showed Operation Disappearance, which the cover and the entire book was illustrated by Earl Norm. Now, I will talk about these books on this page. So if you're curious who did what, you just look right here and it'll tell you the exact credits for who we think did thumbnails and layouts, who did final pings. So this, the Spy Eye uh, was by Herb Trimp, Fred Oppenheimer, Finson Blee, whatever. Odds are that it was written, written by Finson Bly. Uh, Herb Trimp handled breakdowns and all art was painted by Fred Ottenheimer. The cover was painted by Earl Norm. So if you want full credits, the Spy Eye cover painted by Earl Norm and the interiors, you can look right here and see that the art was painted by Fred Ott Oppenheimer. So we give credits everywhere possible throughout this book. We want these artists to be known for their amazing work. Both of these were by Earl Norm. This was a reproduction of some of the previous comic books, but I think with better coloring, check that out if you don't have it yet, The Trojan Gambit. It's a very beautiful colors, better than any modern day reproductions. This is a big coloring book called Operation Decoy. It was also released with another cover that was more comic book style illustration. We will only show the painted one here because this book is focused on the painted artwork of G.I. Joe, a real American hero. Now this was a record and it had original artwork on the front and the back. Castle of the Doomed, if you wanna look for that one. So we have an interlude by Kirk Bazigian again. And then we're into the splash page for the 1984 figures. All right, so then we go through the 1984 figures. I'll just rush through these. We talk about some of Ron Rudat's inspiration for the designs. Then we get into the unadorned artwork. I cannot tell you guys how absolutely mind-blowingly good all this stuff looks. I mean, 
Chad Huckle obsessed over these down to the pixel. You will not find a better resource with better G.I. Joe or Real American Hero assets. This spread is actually dedicated to telling you guys about the different types of assets. If it's Kodachromes, which are high resolution transparencies, or if it's Kodak prints. Now this is a scan of a Kodachrome at 2400 DPI. Print resolution is 300 DPI. So if you scan this Kodachrome at 2400 DPI, you can scale that up eight times the size with no loss of resolution. So a six by nine Chrome of Duke like this could be scaled up eight times. That's how we get this, right? With no loss of resolution. This is the best thing next to having the painting. And as I think many of you know, the original painting no longer exists. The original painting was painted over for Tiger Force Duke for 1988 Tiger Force Duke. So if you have a Kodachrome of Duke, that is the best resource that you will have for that artwork. And you scan it in using a professional graphic art scanner. We use a Epson GA uh, Graphic Arts XL 11,000. Uh, it's about a $3,500 scanner. And scan it in at 2400 DPI, and then just sit there in Photoshop and restore the heck out of it. That is our process. All right, so here are additional unadorned paintings for 1984. And we wanted to talk about the repetitive poses that you'll notice on some of the card backs. And we interviewed Ed Morrill about this. Ed Morrill was the man that did the thumbnail sketches for each of these packages. So Grunt, Dusty, exact same pose. Cobra, Roadblock, very similar pose. Stalker, Leatherneck, very similar pose. Major Blood, Shockwave, very similar pose. 89, Snake Eyes, version three. And the Cobra Ninja, Viper, very similar pose, arguably painted on top of potentially. So we wanted to talk about that. We did some interviews on the topic. We interviewed about the, the rationale behind Zartan being a single carded figure at first and then being rolled out with the uh, chameleon instead. We were lucky enough to get our hands on Kodak Chromes and Kodak prints of both of those. So beautiful spread there, uh, describing how the color change plastic resulted in a new category that G.I. Joe had to fill every year, which was a big bad guy with a vehicle. So you saw that in 84 with Zartan, 86 with Serpentor. You saw it again in 88 with Destro version two. Uh, you saw it in 87 with Zanzibar. That's what they uh, considered that one. Uh, you saw it with Darklon again. You saw it with Overlord and his dictator. Like it just happened again and again. And it all started with Zartan and the Chameleon being so successful at retail. They didn't want to reinvent the wheel. They wanted to use the same product categories that were useful. And it, once they had something that was a success, they were obviously going to repeat it again and again and again until it was no longer a success. And so starting with Zartan in 84 and going all the way up through 1990, that's what we got. All right, so now we'll move into the vehicles. You get the catalogs, you get a splash page, and then you go through all the vehicles with all their file cards. Drop dead gorgeous. I just, I couldn't be happier with this, you guys. This is probably like, this is bittersweet, man. It's like sending my kid to college. Um, all right, so this is the unadorned art for 84. To have something that we've worked on for so long, so hard, and here we are at the end of it, like it's definitely like a little emotional. So anyway, we wanted to talk about how not everything was perfect or beautiful. So the, the nice stinger is not a Garrido. The Vamp Mark II, it's not a Garrido. And we'll call a spade a spade. Not everything was perfect in a real American hero. And the perspective on this, and the perspective on this, do not even come close to the perspective on the Vamp Mark I, nor the level of detail with which it was illustrated. So we wanted to talk about how the internal art department, which was run by Matthew Lysak, they would create things on their own and they, they weren't, they emulated Garrido. They didn't necessarily replicate Garrido. They did not have that capability in house yet. And so if you see something that looks a little bit off, that doesn't look like a Garrido, that looks like it has more airbrushing in it. If it doesn't look like it's meticulously, painstakingly painted with gouache, um, it's probably not Garrido. So anyway, these are uh, package comps that were done for the 1982 lineup. Pretty interesting. Snake Eyes looks like he's brown. He has an open mask there. Uh, but I've been assured that he was supposed to be black, and so that's probably just like a color thing, so black didn't like fade into darkness. You see the two arrows again. So you open up this double gatefold spread and we get unadorned art for the killer whale. Now, the reason that these double gatefold spreads are great is that they allow us to really stretch these landscape aspect ratio illustrations out and show them really large. So that killer whale is pretty huge. We had some extra space there. So I wanted to show off the diagrammatic illustrations that they created to illustrate the play features of each vehicle. Then we have more unadorned artwork. 
one of my favorites there with rock and roll rocking the machine gun defense unit. I just think that's a uh, amazing piece of artwork. And I was very lucky to get a coat of chrome of that. So we finish up this double gatefold spread with more unadorned artwork from 1984. That's also another favorite of mine with Ricondo and Zap manning the howitzer. All right, so now we're back to books. And this is where we got into the kind of listen and look where you could listen to a record or listen to a cassette and read along with the book. Now the artwork is in Earl Norum. It's not quite as beautiful as some of the Earl Norum stuff, but it's still cool. It's still painted artwork and it's of course still included. And there were several of those. So you'll see all of those. Now the 1985 figure splash page, then you get of course all the 1985 figures. You get the twins packaging, which is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, just really brilliant conceptually how the mirrors play off of the twins and their dual personalities. And then you see a duel of each of them in the mirror. And on the back of the package, this was the first package that had two paintings on it. On the back of the package, there's the twins looking at each other basically through a mirror, one with a scar, one without. So you'll see a mix of quotes from Ron Rudat, Ed Morrill, Kirk Bazigian, Mark Pennington, whoever's appropriate to that section and had good stories to share, that's who we'll be uh, speaking with. So talking about all the promos and different card backs that were available in 1985, the mail order offers are included there, of course. Now we wanted to touch on all the variants of file cards. We're only featuring one file card for each figure, but I wanted to show that there are tons of variants out there for you guys to collect. So if you're, everybody knows about Zartan and the kind of dust up over him being paranoid schizophrenic and how they edited it to remove that, I'd say proportionately less people know that there was five buzzer file cards. Amazing, the iterations that they created for buzzer. First, they take out his mental health issues. Then they take out that he became fascinated with the biker gang that he was researching, and that's when he converted into a biker gang guy. It's just, you know, they edited this one, put a sticker on it, then they printed it this way, and then they decided to revise it again, and then they uh, rolled them out in 86 with just a graphic design update. So I wanted you guys to see how many different iterations there could be of any given file card. So we're in the unadorned art section. And again, you know, for each of these unadorned art sections, I like to talk about where I got this stuff. So this came from a licensing folder that had a bunch of prints in it, uh, Kodak photo prints. They're good sources. They're third tier sources. So top tier source is the painting. Number two source would be a Kodachrome high resolution transparency. Number three source would be a Kodak photo print. Number four source would be a printed book that shows the unadorned artwork. That's not quite as good because then you're gonna see the printing artifacts. So I'll explain kind of where all these came from. Now, as I started to secure multiple examples of different pieces of unadorned artwork, I started to notice some differences in them. So you'll see this Crimson Guard, and you can tell which one is the earlier and which one's the later by which one ended up on the final product. So this Crimson Guard was edited really significantly. So I'll call out all the different edits that were made here with the shoulder pauldrons, for example, or the insignias on his rank, or the size of his helmet. There's just tons of changes that are made here. The same with eels. He originally had little water bubbles coming up off of him. He had a much smaller backpack. He's got this gigantic backpack here, and the bubbles have been removed. Why? I don't know. I talked about it with Ed Morrill, the uh, guy that was in charge of packaging. He said that the artwork was never returned to them for revisions. So neither Ed Morrill nor Hector Garrido were responsible for these revisions, which tells you that it happened in-house at Matt Lysak's department. And so one example of this is CoverGirl. They created a dramatic CoverGirl portrait. And we know about this portrait because it was released on the trading cards that came out in 1986. This is the original artwork with the original portrait. But what we received on the final product is a much more upright, much more brightly lit, and much more emotionless cover girl. So here's the cover girl that has all the drama that made it out in the trading card set. Here's the cover girl that, <laughs> in Ed Morrill's words, looks like she's driving a 40-ton tank to go grocery shopping. There's no emotion there, right? So Ed Morrill was uh, very disappointed in these revisions that were made to cover girl. He, he was not happy about it. It's so fun to talk with these guys and see how like emotionally attached they still are to this stuff. So I vote for this eels as the better painting. So that's the one that I'm including full size there for you guys to enjoy. And we'll just keep going through the unadorned art section here. Snow Serpent's another one that went through significant revisions. This was the original rocket design with these little fins coming off of it. And oddly enough, the, the handle is hidden by his glove here. But if you look at the painting here, 
Hector Garrido didn't put the handle on this AK-47. So the revised painting has the handle put in there and corrects the rocket for the actual rocket that was released. But you can see in the original drawings and then the presentation artwork by George Woodbridge, more on him in a bit, they were gonna release this rocket with these little fins coming off of it. All right, so now we're in the 1985 vehicle section. You get the catalog, you get the unadorned art. Now this is a pre-production piece for the USS Flag. And oddly enough, you see Flint giving a tour to Torch. So we put a little close up on that here. I was able to get this Kodachrome, scan it, zoom it in. This is a very early version of the USS Flag with some corrections yet to be made. All right, then we'll go through the 1985 vehicles. We talk about the elusive exclusives. As you guys know, it started in 1982 with the Cobra Missile Command Headquarters. That tradition continued for many, many years. So here are the uh, two Sears sets from 1985. Then we'll go into the double gate fold spread. So when, again, when you see these arrows, you grab the arrows and you open it up and enjoy. So here is the Cobra Hydrofoil, the Moray designed by Ron Rudat. And we talk about in this double gate fold spread, the product photography that was used on the catalog and also on the back of the product package to show off the features for each of these. So this is the uh, transportable tactical battle platform. And here's the role of advertising and artwork. So this is basically taken from, I was so lucky I got to interview Bob Prupus shortly before he passed away. Thank you so much to his daughter, Sherry, for making that connection. Uh, this leans on the Bob Prupus interview, Kirk Bizigian's interview, and talking about in 1982, why did they decide to invest in painted artwork for every single product? This was such a huge investment on Hasbro's part, and they believed in the power of illustration. So this interview is everything to me. This is why this book exists. Bob Prupus and Kirk Bazigian knew they needed to tell this story and they didn't have a movie. They were going to have a comic book, but they didn't have it right out of the gate. Keep that in mind. So they believed 100% that these illustrations had to tell a compelling story of G.I. Joe. They had to enroll you and enlist you and make you believe in this brand and want to live in this world by investing heavily in beautiful artwork that told compelling stories. And so I just love that interview. I hope you guys love it too. All right, so we're uh, continuing through the 1985 vehicles. And then we get into the unadorned artwork courtesy of a licensing guide that was rolled out in 1986, but it featured 1985 artwork. There was also a 1986 uh, sticker calendar that featured a, a lot of beautiful unadorned artwork. If you wanna search for that, it's by Hoyle Products. You can find that on eBay sometimes. So we've got a lot of 1985 unadorned artwork. You can tell the international ones because they have these little logos on them that came from the licensing folder. And then stuff like this usually comes from a Kodachrome or Kodak print. All right, so now we're gonna get into the premiere issue of G.I. Joe magazine. So this was a licensed magazine and it was painted by Hector Garrido, the cover, and he's credited on the inside. And then the 1985 catalog artwork that I call Yojo, that was actually repainted. Now this all stayed the same, but they repainted the background to make it a nighttime scene with fireworks. And that's pretty cool. That was the pullout poster for the first issue of the magazine. So here we are at a double gatefold spread. Grab those arrows, spread them. All right, the get into action. This was an insert with the Action Star serial. So we're we'll talk about that a little bit. This was an ad inside of the magazine that was enrolling you in the club that they wanted you to join. So here's our first chance to show the 1985 catalog art and all its glory. Shout out to Dan Uthman, he sold me that Kodachrome. You know, again, every image that I have came from somewhere. And I can't thank the people enough that thought of me, you know, as the right place that that asset should go to. Because they, they thought, they believed that I would do something well with it. So, you know, Dan Uthman, thank you for entrusting me with this Kodachrome, worth every penny. Now, we got these Find Your Fate books, and issues one through four came out in 85, so those are featured here. The rest of them will be featured in a double gatefold spread, and the reason that I broke them out separate was not only the year, but also the artist. Issues one through four were illustrated by Carl Kassler. Issues five through 20 were illustrated by Hector Garrido, so I wanted to keep those together. All right, uh, Cobra's Revenge was a licensed book by Color Forms with some fun artwork. And then Milton Bradley was acquired by Hasbro. They pretty quickly made this four-piece puzzle collage. I believe that was illustrated by Garrido. I uh, don't think I'm 100% certain on that. And then they also created uh, this Milton Bradley uh, commando attack game. 
Now, this is a, again, an emulating Garrido situation where it's not quite as good as Garrido, but clearly they were taking notes based off of his work. And then we're in the licensed uh, category again, showing some more stuff there. Now, Hasbro Direct is what Kurt Bazigian left G.I. Joe to work on. So 1984, I believe, is when the son of Jose Banks joined Hasbro to help them build out Hasbro Direct. So Kirk Bazigian already had some success with the Manta, Major Blood, Cobra Commander. Those various G.I. Joe offers were successful. Successful enough that they invested in bringing over the son of Jose Banks. Jose Banks had been sold by that time. He came over to Hasbro, worked with Kirk Bazigian for three years to build out Hasbro Direct into a multi-million dollar business. Now, they hired an agency in Manhattan called BBDO, and BBDO would hire different illustrators to create the Hasbro Direct marketing pieces. So you'll see a wide variety of illustrators on Hasbro Direct offers, and most of them are beautiful and compelling. So credited where possible, oftentimes not possible to credit them, but in some cases we did figure it out. So here's another interlude by Kirk Bazigian talking about how things were changing going into 86. Here's the 82 to 85 branding by Ed Morrill, cls and &M, and Matt Lysak's internal Hasbro department. And here is the 1986 revised explosion background, 1986 revised logo. The packaging photos went from the red background to actually shot on this kind of gradient, but it didn't matter because that was edited to remove entirely. So vehicles were just shown on black at that point. Figures went from being featured in dioramas to shot on these white backgrounds and shown individually on the cross cells in the catalogs. They also started coming up with annual themes for every year. So the theme for 1986 was live the adventure and obviously Steel Brigade helped people to live the adventure. We'll get into the 1986 figures. That's the big splash page and then you get all figures. This is one of my favorite years because this is the year mom let, him, let me start buying G.I. Joe. Uh, Zorana, as most of you know, they were not happy with their head sculpt, as is explained in this memo. And so they only ran 50,000 units of this head sculpt. Bill Merkline was hired as quickly as possible to sculpt a new head, and that was rushed into production, and we ended up with this Zorana. And so there's only 50,000 units of her mint on card out there, uh, actually created, certainly not still out there mint on card. So if you're a mint on card collector, go get your Zorana with earrings before everybody reads this section. And I expect the value will go up on her because of the exposure of this 50,000 pieces, limited to 50,000 pieces. Now the original artwork for her Hasbro is actually creating a new Zorana that has the bare shoulder with the dragon tattoo in honor of Ron Rudat's original design for her, which is amazing. Shout out to Hasbro for, you know, seeing some of this pre-production stuff and making the figures to kind of make up for what we lost back in the day. Again, file card variants for Xandar. So just calling out different things here and there. This is some of Bill Merkline's sculpting portfolio. He's a good friend of mine. I've been up to his house and stayed with him several times now. He was an amazing, is an amazing figure sculptor. I started working with Hasbro in 83. Rakonda was his first figure. Worked on figures through 89. His last products were on shelves in 1990. This is from Ron Rudat, showing that the Bats was originally a bionic trooper with a flesh arm. And so this, this guy was originally bionic, which means a combination of a human and technology. He was not usually, he was not actually an android at first. Good thing they turned him into an android so that Sergeant Slaughter could tear him apart in the cartoon. So Sergeant Slaughter came on board in 1986. The spring of 1986, he had this promotion on card backs. And then later in 86, you had the body transfer promotion. So again, we're talking about all the different card backs that were available, different promo pack ins like the stickers that were available. These stickers came with the card set, but they actually were the body, same artwork was used for the body transfer tattoos. We talk about the exclusive Special Mission Brazil, which featured a new figure, which was Claymore, kind of a kit bash of previous figures. Now they actually repainted over the original paintings to create these file card paintings that had the revised decos for 86. So sadly, if you look at a photo of the full wetsuit painting, it's got gray just on part of it. And then it's got the original brighter deco on the rest of the painting. I don't call everything beautiful and amazing if it's not. And so I did want to call out how ridiculous this Cobra Battle Gear set was, how they took Flash off of it and put a Crimson Guard. Basically, I guess he's running away from the Joes, but he's like flying through midair as if he had jumped off the tank. It's just a silly illustration. And they also edited it to put in the new digital explosion background. So not every decision was brilliant. But overall, it's an unparalleled brand with artwork 
investment that was rivaled by none. I wholeheartedly believe that Hasbro invested more in unique painted artwork for this brand than any toy company did on any other brand, and I would gladly debate that with anybody. All right, so this is the cereal that was created. They actually invested a tremendous amount of money in advertising for Action Stars. So this was a huge win for Hasbro. Commercials started airing in the fall of 1985. The Wave 1 boxes, there was three different boxes. They did not offer Starduster yet, but they did tease Starduster with this little photo showing that he was coming. And then the Wave 2 boxes, there was three different Wave 2 boxes, and those actually offered Starduster and you could get them. They also included these three mini comics that were created by Marvel. And you could send off for Starduster and you get him back with the file card and the figure. Now, after Action Stars, Starduster was still available for many, many years. I, I believe through 1990 with the Incredible Shrinking Joes, that's the last time that he was available. Now he was still shown all the way through 1993 with the Fangs of Doom, but he wasn't available for purchase at that time. He was just shown with the Pocket Patrol. So now we're back into the cartoon section, and these are some of the posters that were made by FHE because they were selling the VHSs in stores. And there's some trade magazine ads and that kind of thing. And then this beautiful image illustrated by Will Munijo. So we talk about G.I. Joe the movie here. This is the American poster, and this is the international poster, as you can see, edited to take out the red, white, and blue stars and stripes. Grab these two little arrows and open it up. And this is one of my favorite of the double gatefold spreads. So this is the cartoon art section. This came from the show Bible that belonged to Flint Dill, who was a writer and showrunner and editor for the show. So you have all the black and white stuff over here on the left-hand side. It's got a mix of, you know, letterhead explaining things, who are the new characters. It had turnarounds, uh, which uh, for the cartoon were used for the illustrators to make sure that they illustrated the figures consistently. It's got the full bios by Larry Hama and uh, a mix of some presentation art by like George Woodbridge for those two, uh, cartoon cells again and again. And then on this side, we have full color models for the cartoon, which are gorgeous. A shout out to my friend, Steve Chu. And he connected with Flint Deal. And that is the way that all of this brilliant content from this double gatefold spread made it into the omnibus hardcover. So when you're done with it, put the arrows back together and then move on. So now we're in the unadorned art section. 1986. So here's a little two-page spread on Guy Cassidy. Now Guy Cassidy is just a brilliant vehicle designer. His first project was the Conquest X30 and so that's shown here in great detail. But he also became the king of big vehicles. He did the Mobile Command Center, he did the Rolling Thunder, he did the General, he did the Hammerhead. Like he was the king of big vehicles. But he also did a bunch of little vehicles and we'll talk more about that later. I went to Guy Cassidy's house in what, 2013? So it's been 10 years ago now. And you will not meet a nicer guy that worked on the brand. He's just amazing. Uh, so anyway, it's, it's so great to have uh, formed these friendships with these people and to be able to share their stories throughout this book. And I wanna give a shout out to Hasbro for a second here. I wrote 75,000 words for this book based primarily on the interviews that I did with these creators. And guess what? Hasbro did not edit a single word. Thank you Hasbro for letting these creators tell their stories unedited, unvarnished. Okay, so now we're into the 1986 vehicle section. We'll shoot through those. You obviously get all the file cards that came with each one of those. Get into the exclusive Dreadnought Ground Assault stuff, Air Assault stuff, I love those. All right, so here we are at another Devil Gatefold spread. And this is unadorned artwork, as well as the product photography that I was telling you guys about. And this is just a brilliant photo. I got a large transparency of this, and it shows the original head sculpt for Zorana. It shows her with blue shoulder armor, which I thought was interesting. You have the Serpentor with the gold neck. So here is year two of Hasbro Direct. So we were able to pin down that this was illustrated by Theodore Giavis, AKA Ted, because a corner of this illustration had half of his signature on it. I was able to kind of reverse engineer and figure out who that signature belonged to. So Ted Giavis did this, they, he was hired by BBDO. Hector Garrido again did the Live the Adventure 1986 catalog art. There's the Live the Adventure logo that I got off of Kodachrome and the G.I. Joe logo that I got off another Kodachrome. Shout out to Joe Goldston, my good friend who purchased that from Dan Klingensmith, and that's where that comes from. All right, so if you open these two arrows, here is the Find Your Fate spread, and ain't it glorious. 
So this is issues number five through 20. And they are all by Hector Garrido. And one of the things I wanted to talk about here was how he used some repetitive poses. You know, I interviewed Ed Morrill about this. I interviewed Kirk Bazigian about this. And they both felt like he just did it because it would be faster that way. Not because he necessarily was told you need to use the same poses as the package art for like ease of recognition for these characters that people were already familiar with. It wasn't like a decision that came from Hasbro. Garrido decided, I'm going to take this flint facial expression and I'm going to use it here again because why not? I'm going to take this snake eyes pose and I'm going to use it here again because why not? Crimson Guard, I'm going to paint him the same pose, but he did change some things. So you notice like the badge is missing on that shoulder or you'll notice on the bareness that her glasses are missing, that kind of thing. BBDO was doing some absolutely beautiful artwork. This was illustrated by Paul Alexander. Paul Alexander actually did the artwork for Air Raiders. And so you might notice this from the cross sell catalog for Air Raiders. And this is a nice little detailed close up of it. Now, Paul Alexander tended to sign his work. And so you'll notice a signature on the mountain right here. So that was an easy one to find. I also was able to scan this Kodachrome and his signature was on the margins of that Kodachrome. So it's nice when they make it easy for us. He also had the uh, Alexander signature right under Cobra Commander's leg right there. But Paul Alexander was a brilliant illustrator. I wish we got more G.I. Joe stuff from him. So in 1987, they kicked off the G.I. Joe magazine again. And this is, you know, they had only done one issue previously. So this is where they really started producing several more issues. Now, Dave Dorman, by this point, had been brought in to create presentation artwork for Hasbro's new G.I. Joe figures. They had to show presentation artwork to management to get them to buy off on each upcoming figure. And so Dave Dorman was brought in to also illustrate the interior artwork for G.I. Joe magazine. So you'll see several pieces by him in the pages that follow. The Hector Garrido 1986 catalog art was edited to remove Hawk and the low crawl vehicle and a couple other thing, elements, the big tree, the snake that was, that was going through. And they added the Triple T and they added Sergeant Slaughter. So the original catalog art, I call that an early 86 release. I call this a late 86 release. This was contributed by Jim Sorensen. So thank you so much, Jim, for providing this. Now, why is this in a G.I. Joe book? Because this is Brad Armbruster, ace from G.I. Joe. If you watch the Masterson team episode of Inhumanoids, he was out on a mission and he recounts that he was shot down out of the sky. His, his plane crashed and he ended up in this hospital bed, literally wrapped up in the metal of his plane. So they were able to save him and he basically join the team and help to fight the Inhumanoids. So shared continuity universe, Inhumanoids, a, a special appearance by Ace after his plane wreck. All right, so we'll move on to the 1987 figures. You got a beautiful splash page here with Falcon, my favorite, of course. All the 1987 figures. This is where Mark Pennington came in and Ron Rudat had already designed the rough drafts for most of the 1987 figures. He had already done kind of the ideation, the toying around with different designs, the working with the brand manager to kind of refine and decide which ones they were gonna move forward with, but they still needed to do all the figure sculpture sheets, the turnarounds, the accessory engineering drawings and that kind of thing. Most of that was left undone. You'll learn how Mark Pennington kind of picked it up and carried it forward for 1987. Now he was hired on December 31st, 1985, and his first day wasn't until 1986. It was just kind of an accounting thing. They wanted him in the system before the end of the year. So Mark Pennington started in 1986, and he created a ton of the 1987 stuff. Some of it was finishing up Ron's work. Some of it was his work from scratch. Uh, Jinx was actually his work. And so you'll learn about that. You'll also see some figures like Falcon here, where Ron Rudat did the original accessory designs, and then Pennington just came up behind him and did some revisions, like adding in the knife that slid down in there. So, you know, this was much more of a collaborative effort. I'd say Ron Rudat did 75%, 80% of the lifting. He did the figure turnaround for this one, for example. But anyway, we'll, we'll describe in detail how those two kind of handed it off. Now, Steel Brigade was done by Ron Rudat, and we wanted to share some of this artwork here. This is all Bill Merkline's sculpture portfolio, and these are all Mark Pennington's basically turnaround drawings. 
these turnaround drawings would be used in the creation of these figures. So this is what Bill Merkline was referencing when he sculpted that figure. So we've kind of put them side by side here so you can see kind of before and after what Outback looked when Mark Pennington drew it, what Outback looked like when Bill Merkline sculpted it. 1987 card backs and offers, we'll talk about those. Then we get into the subgroups. So you got the Battle Force 2000 in 1987, first big subgroup, not counting Special Mission Brazil. Then we talk about the uh, G.I. Joe the movie figure, the two three packs, and now how they had original artwork on the back of them as well, kind of like the twins from 1985. Then you flip that over and you got a two page spread so showing all six file cards and the two uh, mint on card specimens, as well as the artwork from the back of the, of the uh, card backs as well. All right, now Ron Rudak created a bunch of examples of Pythona. None of these actually went through to fruition. Uh, the Pythona design was created by Sunbow. I got my hands on a 1987 licensing guide, and this had Kodachromes for every single figure from 1987. Because of that, you will see every single mainline 1987 figure in the unadorned art section. So again, if you're ever looking for a specific product, you go down the years, you can see that we're at 1987 here, and then we're at the unadorned art section. If you're looking for the raw artwork, you'll find it under unadorned. We wanted to talk about some of the revisions that were made. Uh, Jinx was originally gonna have the G.I. Joe logo on her leg and a much larger dragon on her chest. You could see on the painting where they painted over the original dragon and where they painted over the original logo that was on her leg. So we wanted to call out that for revising the art of G.I. Joe. This is again, yet another brilliant George Woodbridge presentation illustration. So you'll see every 1987 figure this is not by Hector Garrido. So they started to mix in different illustrators at this point, and this is clearly not Hector Garrido. I went through with Doug Hart for somewhere in the neighborhood of eight or nine hours, and we went through the whole soft cover series and tried to determine who illustrated what. I also went through with Ed Morrill, who was in charge of packaging from 1969 and 1989, and we tried to determine who was responsible for what. So if you see credits on these unadorned art sections, those are based by Doug Hart, who was an internal painter at, at Hasbro, and Ed Morrill, who hired and managed Hector Garrido from 1982 to 1989. All right, so we're wrapping up the 1987 stuff. Now this is the first carded package illustration created by Doug Hart for G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero. So it's a perfect time to introduce Doug Hart. So we have an artist profile for him. Now I originally met him at Hascon in 2017. We're now working together on Operation Recall. He is an absolute pleasure uh, to deal with. He's just such a friendly, lovable guy, incredibly talented. And uh, you know, I just feel really lucky to know him. So we've got a good four page spread there based off of a pretty extensive interview that I did with Doug. And so then we get into the 1987 vehicles. Shout out to Guy Cassidy who put his name into the sticker there. See the Cassidy. So they put all kinds of little references on the vehicles in the decal sheets. Uh, another one, I think it's a dead eye or eagle eye on the back of this vehicle. That was in reference to one of Guy Cassidy's relatives who worked on a, a ship in World War II and was known for shooting sharks in the water or something to that effect. All right, so here's the 1987 vehicles. Any of these creators that you wanna learn about, go to 3D Joe's, uh, go under pre-production, and then go under the creators tab, and you'll see some pretty large resources that we've put together uh, to introduce you to these people's work. All right, so now we're in the unadorned art section for 1987. This piece was actually a joint collaboration. Doug Hart did the top and Hector Garrido did the bottom. So that was really fun to figure out. Now, there was another calendar that came out in 1989 by Landmark, but we'll show that here because that was where we find a lot of great 1987 assets. Now, this is one of those that is a bit of a mystery. This mystery kind of continues. So I've got a lead and I'm working on it basically, but I believe that this was going to be the catalog illustration for 1987. But then when they rushed the Defiant through into production, they scrapped this image and Doug Hart created the new 1987 catalog image. That's the theory that makes the most sense right now. So back to Earl Norum, uh, this is Fool's Gold. Uh, this was a Kodachrome contributed by Paige Wagner. Again, everywhere this stuff came from, I remember it. I thank you all. 
We wanted to talk about Earl Norm again because we know that Earl Norm did this one because Chris Murray has the original pencils for this. They're signed by Norm. We believe very strongly that both of these were illustrated by Earl Norm. We do not believe that this is Earl Norm. We think this is Hector Garrido. And that's all talked about on the previous page. Now, Earl Norm illustrated both of these books, again, for Marvel. Operation Raging River and Operation Starfight have some of the best G.I. Joe, Real American Hero painted artwork that you will find. And so he was actually credited inside on those. I think most of us recognize Earl Norm's artwork by now. He was not credited on any of these. So these were created by Ballantine Books and they're called Young Adult Fiction Books. There was six of these, but we do have several pieces of data that confirm that these are Earl Norm's. So there was a eBay auction that showed the pencils for this signed by Earl Norm. And there was an eBay auction for these that showed the rough drafts for what would end up being the cover of The Sultan's Secret, both credited to Earl Norm. I think we can safely extrapolate that all six of these were illustrated by Earl Norm. So he's credited as such. All right, now we're back into the G.I. Joe the Magazine. There's a lot of artwork in here by Dave Dorman. He started doing the pull-out posters as well as the covers. Now they started getting other interior artists. Paul Jennis did these. Hovik Delakian did these illustrations here. But Dave Dorman uh, did, the, uh, did the cover for this one. And that's been edited, you know, so that it looks raw. There was also some other cool illustrations in there for the visionaries. I just kind of snuck that in there. The magazine, basically it was the Dave Dorman show by this point. Well, again, we've got Hovick's interior artwork, Hovick's interior artwork on these, but Dave Dorman was doing the covers and the posters by this point. All right, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the external presentation artwork of George Woodbridge and David Dorman. So there was internal presentation artwork that was shown to management to get approval to move forward on you know, the engineering side of figure development. Now, once they had that approval, they also created external presentation artwork. And the reason they held off on creating that is that they had to spend money on this. This was contract work. George Woodbridge and Dave Dorman were not Hasbro employees. They were paid every time, right? So they weren't gonna create external presentation artwork until they knew that management was letting them move forward with the engineering aspect of that figure. So George Woodbridge was hired and David Dorman were hired as contractors to create beautiful polished presentation artwork for new G.I. Joe figures. These would be shown in sales meetings with buyers like Toys R Us, Sears, and so forth. Absolutely beautiful artwork. Thank you to Dan Moore for uh, letting me scan the original painting of this one. Again, I always remember you guys. All right, so the wrap up of the magazine, this is the last couple issues here. We were able to nail down, Paul Kirchner is actually credited right there. Uh, Paul Kirchner illustrated this stuff. He worked in toys. Uh, he worked on Dino Riders, Crash Dummies, Spy Tech for Tycos. He wrote the backstories, did the impact comics and the animation scripts. So uh, you'll learn a little bit about every artist that I can properly give credit to. You'll learn a little bit about them. This was another Dave Dorman cover, also credited Lorene Haynes. That's my favorite of all the covers that Dorman did. Mark Pennington, figure designer, did these interior illustrations. I thought that was pretty fun. Dave Dorman did these uh, interior illustrations for this story. All right, so BBDO was still at it, creating beautiful illustrations for mail order items. Live the Adventure, uh, year two. Now year one was Invade Cobra Island. Uh, year two was Operation Space Station. But look at this Defiant illustration. That's just gorgeous. So again, uh, Kirk Bazigian did not remember or have information on who the illustrator was for this uh, mail order insert, but it was definitely an illustrator that was hired by BBDO and they created some beautiful illustrations. This is more BBDO stuff. Sergeant Slaughter is still hanging in there strong, still battling Cobra Commander. Not every BBDO illustration was brilliant. This one's okay. You know, this one's pretty darn good. This one's, eh, it's just okay. And uh, this one's okay. This one's great. And then these are just, let's be honest, these are not great. So uh, I talked with Kirk Bazigian about that and we've got some candid commentary in there from Kirk. We've got candid commentary from the creators throughout this book. Uh, so now we're in the license section and Marsh Allen Industries was popular with creating uh, kind of like metal tin based products. And so they did lunch trays, trash cans, hot plates, like where you put your pot on when it's hot off the stove kind of thing. So some uh, unique artwork that obviously emulates what they did with the package art, but it's a completely new illustration of it. And then we got some kind of Vietnam era green shirts jumping out of the tomahawk. I absolutely love that dinner tray and trash can illustration. 
And then uh, Presto Magic, they did some uh, pretty cool little stickers. So we started having fun, uh, Chad and I, with the layout of this stuff. If, there, if there's items that looked like they could be on top of the pages, like these stickers, we started having them bust through the kind of panels on the left and right where it made sense. And I think that adds like a lot of depth to the book. So Chad and I had a really good time working on this. Again, it's kind of bittersweet. You know, we got to figure out what we want to do next for a passion project. We've we've got our day jobs. We've got our traditional ways that we make a living. But, you know, for me, this has been a passion project for many, many years. And uh, I'll keep rolling with 3D Joe's. Obviously, I'll keep rolling with Operation Recall. But best believe there's going to be something right behind this that I'm going to dig in on. All right, this is the 1988 Battle Gear Accessory Pack for Cobra. This was illustrated by Earl Norum. Again, Chris Murray has the original of this. Now, I was able to get the eight, nine by 11 or so Kodachrome, scan it in at 2400 DPI, and then blow that up over here. I mean, who's ever seen this illustration at this level of detail? The only way you could do that is by having that original Kodachrome, a large one, and scanning it in 2400 DPI, just really zooming in on it. So that's a beautiful illustration of Hardball, Shockwave, Spearhead, and Max. And I think, honestly, Spearhead and Max, they look better here than they did on their package art. Spearhead and Max were not illustrated by Garrido, uh, and we talk about that in here as well. So 1988 figure page spread, splash page. Uh, this is by Earl Norm. We're 99% certain. Hydro Viper is an absolutely beautiful painting. Um, so they were using some contractors at this point, and it was a mix of people. I believe this is Earl Norm as well. You can tell a Garrido, this is absolutely not a Garrido because Garrido would have used a heavy white outline here to separate the foreground element of the rifle from the background element of the body, like on Shockwave right here. This is how you can tell a Garrido. This is how you can definitely confirm that it is not a Garrido. So we, uh, we get into you know the 1988 figures. Now this is the Mark Pennington show, so there's a lot of commentary from Mark here about why he designed different figures different elements that played into it. We talk about all the different card backs and offers that came out in 1988. Toy Fair, they're still using marker comps for the vehicles going into Toy Fair catalogs. So I wanted to show that. This was actually the last year that they did that. They would not show marker comps in Toy Fair catalogs going forward. They did their first live action TV commercial that was fully live action, not like a cameo by the fridge or a cameo by Sergeant Slaughter. This was a full 30 second uh, live action commercial. This was uh, by BBDO, the advertising agency that helped build Hasbro Direct for Kirk Bazigian. They were the ones that pitched live action. Griffin Bacall kind of elbowed their way into the project, but it definitely came from BBDO. And this was the precursor to the 1990 live action TV commercials that we would see in 1990. All right, Hit and Run, this is another exclusive, Target exclusive. We got the two packs of Battle Force 2000 that were re-releases. We have the Toys R Us Night Force stuff. We have the Tiger Force re-releases. Again, these were painted on top of the original paintings. So these original paintings do not exist anymore. Every one of these was painted over by Hector Garrido. Ed Morrill was shipped the artwork. Ed Morrill passed them off to Hector Garrido and they painted over the originals. This was a very cool piece. Got this from Bill Merkline. This was the sculpt sheet drawn by Mark Pennington. So Mark Pennington has signed it, sculpted by Bill Merkline and si signed by Sergeant Slaughter. So I got this triple signed for, uh, I sold this on behalf of Bill Merkline and got it triple signed and scanned it. And uh, I thought that was just an amazing opportunity to get all three people. It is Sergeant Slaughter. It was designed by Mark Pennington and it was sculpted by Bill Merkline. Here you see the photos of Bill Merkline's actual sculpt that he made. Here's the internal memo kicking it off. Here's the marketing where they show their Hasbro figure that is dominating the LJN figures. He's literally got his foot on the throat of Hulk Hogan. He's eight inches of slaughter power. All right, anyway, uh, 1988 vehicles, splash page, and then you got the 1988 catalog. You get all the 1988 vehicles, all the file cards. I could not be happier with how this looks. The Night Force exclusives, the Tiger Force uh, repaints, and uh, action packs. Now we were lucky to get some of the original unadorned artwork for the action packs. These were by Hector Garrido. Uh, these are proof cards. For the vehicle packs, these are very hard to find, very uh, very short supply. These two came from this calendar, so I do try to call out where you guys can search out and acquire some of these unadorned art pieces. If you want the original prints, you know where to go. This was the original presentation artwork by Mark Pennington for the scuba pack. Thank you again to Sam. 
Now this was illustrated by David Graves. I was very happy to get this little piece of information from Doug Hart when we did our big sit down interview to try to figure out and pin down who did each illustration. Dave Graves worked for Hasbro in the packaging department. And so this was his one kind of shot at glory with GI Joe. So it was very cool to be able to give him some credit for that. A little bit of unadorned artwork, a little bit of BBDO direct mail, but they were definitely like tapering off the BBDO stuff by this point in 1988. This was a puzzle collage. This was the second puzzle collage. Doug Hart painted this one. This was the second puzzle collage. The first one we believe was done by Garrido. This was the first one done by Hart and you'll meet one later. So uh, this is the licensing stuff that has original Yeek painted artwork for it. Again, not everything is brilliant here. Dusty is very problematic, <laughs> but if it's unique original painted artwork, we want to feature it. I kind of love the happy-go-lucky look of Hit and Run and Repeater here. Basically, it looks like the same face, just with some face camo added for Hit and Run. Anyway, so we're on to the 1989 figures. Uh, there's our little splash page. Here's all the 1989 figures. Most of these were done by Mark Pennington. And there's a description of some of the inspiration for those figures. And we also talk about the card backs and offers, the introduction of Rampage, which uh, actually came from Brazil. Now, Night Force Year 2 was a big effort. Uh, we also got introduced to the Python Patrol. Now, the Python Patrol were all repaints except for Copperhead, who had not been previously released on a card. So that was illustrated by Doug Hart, and I wanted to feature that really big over here. The same with Slaughter's Marauders. All these were painted over the originals, except for Sergeant Slaughter. This was also illustrated by Doug Hart, and so I wanted to feature that really big as a call out. So unadorned artwork for 1989. Shout out to David Arenas for hooking me up with an international licensing catalog that had all of this unadorned artwork. This was a late edition, and thank you, David. 1989 vehicles, again, you can find your place, 1989, and we're on the vehicles. So at any time, if you wanna to try to figure out, you know, where you are, what you're looking for, use these for your years and use this for the index of the content. Now, Guy Cassidy, I wanted to give him a shout out. He designed all of these small vehicles. So he wasn't just the, you know, the king of big vehicles. He also did a bunch of small vehicles. The Night Boomer was also repainted. So I wanted to show the Sky Striker box art, the Night Boomer artwork, and then the final product. And you can tell that some things were changed, right? So this painting is at Hasbro. It features the original explosion background that was painted on the original Sky Striker, but they painted over the Sky Striker for both of these Night Boomers. And you can tell that they edited this one and pushed it out and scaled it up right? So there's been edits made and obviously they got rid of the explosion background and put in that digital uh, explosion background. So a lot of those edits were being made in post-production by this point. Desktop publishing had taken off and so a lot of those edits were made on the computer. Now in Brazil, they had been licensing GI Joes and making their own GI Joes for years. Hasbro finally partnered with them to manufacture overseas vehicles. From 1982 to 1994, all of the G.I. Joe Real American Hero vehicles were manufactured in the United States in factories around Rhode Island. So for them to go out of the country and have Brazil manufacture vehicles for them was a two-factor thing. Number one, the vehicles were already down there because they had licensed them to them so that they could make their own stuff and sell it in South America. Number two, since labor was cheaper, they could do more complex uh, paint applications. So Tiger Force and Python Patrol were both produced in Brazil. So Slaughter's Marauders, Tiger Force. Now here we get into some licensed artwork. We nicknamed these guys Flathead and Bobber. Uh, these were from a fishing kit and a tool kit, a battle ready tool kit. Uh, those were both put out by the Woods Dream Corporation. A little bit of unique artwork created for stuff like crayons. You know, so if that kind of stuff exists, it's in the book. Now there was a commemorative coin package that came out and we were able to get some scans off of that. So we got some unadorned artwork. But again, this is in my opinion, like fourth tier assets. The best thing would be the painting. The second best thing would be the Kodachrome. Third best thing would be a Kodak print. Fourth best thing would be a published object being scanned because then you're gonna see the print artifacts from that, the nature of that publishing, the dot matrix kind of stuff. I got this international licensing guide from David Arenas. And so this was cool because I was able to connect with Richard John Marsege, and he was in the internal art department and he was responsible for creating a lot of the black and white line art that retailers would use for their advertising. So Hasbro would release line art catalogs every year. And the purpose of that was for retailers to be able to 
advertise the new products that were coming out with black and white artwork. All right, so we'll get through the unadorned artwork. And now we're into 1990, Turning the Tide. This is part of a giant Doug Hart mural that Doug Hart worked on for two months. He recalled working on this for two months. This was inspired by the Air Raiders piece that I showed you guys earlier for the cross sell. The If you look at this piece, the wide view, I'll show it to you later, and then you compare it to that Air Raiders cross sell, it's got a similar layout in that there's people on the edges that are up higher, like on the high ground, and then people are working their way up towards them. And so Doug Hart recounted being inspired by that Air Raiders piece when he created this giant piece. So I wanted to talk about like the theme for this year was Get Tough. Uh, the cartoon Got to Get Tough, Yo Joe, came out. It's a much more playful cartoon. Uh, Vinny DeLivia talked a lot about the shifting television standards at the time. That things had to be more playful, less serious. Um, and so you get some insight from Vinny DeLivia as to why the Deke cartoon was not only lower quality in terms of the production itself, but was also a little more silly in terms of the storytelling. So that's discussed here. They were in live action movie production kind of hell in the early 90s. There were several studios, they were writing scripts, they were pitching to Hasbro, and a live action movie almost came. And if you guys remember the comic book movies of the day, it was hard to get a comic book movie produced back in the 90s. So you know it was hard to get a toy line live action movie produced back in the 90s. But there was lots of stuff that was in development, so you'll learn about it here. Um, tons of insight from Kurt Bazigan, who was vice president of Boys Toys, and Vinny DeLivia, who was in charge of the brand by this point. All right, we'll go through the 1990 figures quickly. And we'll talk, of course, about the artistic inspiration for several of these. We'll talk about the different card backs and offers that were rolled out. Combat pay would last three years. That's the longest running promotion. You had other stuff, other pack-ins like the combat uh, command rings and so on and so forth. Sky Patrol, which were repaints of previously released uh, drivers and pilots, but they had new head sculpts. And the decos were so different that I didn't immediately recognize these as a kid, as an 11-year-old kid. I didn't immediately recognize these as their previous releases. So I thought that was a really brilliant uh, way to go about re-releasing old molds as new characters. So we'll talk about the first Walmart exclusive for Rapid Fire. Walmart was becoming a big customer by that point. Talk about the Sky Patrol. We talk about the packaging revision for 1990 that started to include portraits for every figure that was included. This was actually a cost cutting measure. So they didn't have to uh, cut out and put the little cellophane in the front and show the figure. This was a cost cutting measure, but I told Vinny DeLivia, I absolutely felt like this was a value added. I would much rather see a beautifully illustrated figure than a little cellophane, poorly lit figure inside of a bubble. So it's funny how something that was done to save money actually, in my opinion, made a better product. These were the Walmart file cards and there were six of them created. These are two obviously full size paintings, but you can tell that the file cards that were released used a small portion of these paintings. So these were all illustrated by Doug Hart. That's his signature right there, H-A-R-T, like a lowercase t. So Doug Hart painted these for a Walmart executive. This did not go through marketing. This did not go through Kurt Bazigian and Vinny DeLivia. This was actually the sales team working on their Walmart relationships. They directly approached Doug Hart and Matt Lysak's uh, packaging department, and that's how this project came about. Now, 1990 was finally the addition of spring-loaded launchers. This is the original Doug Hart painting. You'll notice that it does not have the drone with the spring-loaded launcher here. That was added to the final packaging. So it's fun to look at the unadorned artwork and see what changes you can see from the final product. There's also some instances of picture-in-picture, kind of small illustrations, and I've blown those up where possible to fill the space and put the spotlight on the artwork itself. All right, so this is all the 1990 artwork. Uh, Sky Patrol, obviously a ton of airbrushing done by Doug Hart on all of those. I talk about some of the special effects that Doug Hart brought to the game, like the canopy, for example. He painted that entire interior with topside, and then he cut out and masked this off and then used an airbrush to do that canopy, uh, that translucent looking canopy on top of the fully rendered artwork. He called those his special effects and Doug brought some really great special effects to the game. So here's some un more unadorned artwork, the general. This was a mystery and we solved it. I'll let you guys read that paragraph about uh, what the theories were and what our final conclusion was. This is the giant mural puzzle piece that was created by Doug Hart for Milton Bradley. It took two months for him to illustrate that. And if you compare this 
to the illustration for Air Raiders, you'll see, you know, that kind of mountainside and the people working their way up the mountain. It was clearly, clearly inspired by the Air Raiders cross sell. All right, so we're on the 1991 figures. We'll work our way through here. You know, and I like to picture uh, the folks at Hasbro flipping through this book and thinking, what's my next classified figure gonna be? I just know that this is gonna, this is gonna get their creative juices pumping and I'm excited uh, to get their feedback on it. So we talk about the 1991 card backs and offers here. They did some revisions on the card back, so I'll start calling that stuff out as well. Now I wanted to introduce Kurt Groen because he was the primary figure designer from 1991 to 1994. He did a little bit of stuff in 1990 as well. Vapor was his very first figure, first day on the job. So Kurt Groen was a huge contributor to the brand and we were able to share the pre-production process for Snow Serpent version two, uh, who came out in 1991. You see the kind of final pencil illustration, a color study, in-house presentation art to show to management, external presentation art by James Payette. Uh, you get to see the engineering drawings for the accessories, a two-up resin painted, painted prototype, also known as a paint master. And then here's the painting by Doug Hart. So really cool to be able to show a figure kind of beginning to end like that. Air Commandos did not feature original artwork on the packaging with the exception of the file cards. So that was kind of a shame, but that's just the way that that product laid out. And then they're all gathered over here. And we also gathered those with the 1991-1992 Battle Copter pilots. All right, then we got into the Eco Warriors. And we'll talk about how in the early 1990s, they did not have a marketing budget. The cartoon was off the air pretty quickly and how they ended up creating all these various sublines for two reasons. Number one, to capitalize on the other popular brands of the day, but number two, to create higher price point figures so that G.I. Joe would not depend on vehicles alone to drive profits. So Sonic Fighters, Electronic Super Sonic Fighters, that was the first foray into more expensive price per figures because they could justify it because of the electronics that were included. So they didn't just create these, you know, because there was a gimmick available, they created these so that the figure category could start to move the bottom line. Uh, you had Color Change Inc. with a lot of these. Uh, DEF had the electronic lights and sounds. Mega Marines had the Play-Doh, but they didn't call it Play-Doh. They called it Bio Armor and on and on and on. You know, these sub brands were there to capitalize on other popular stuff of the day, but they were also there because they could charge a much larger price for these figures. And the figures started to get them towards the profitability that they needed to achieve each year. Now, they finally put a photo studio in at Hasbro around 1989, 1990. And so Doug Hart uh, was able to take in his friends and colleagues like Vinny DeLevian, Kirk Bazigian, into the studio to photograph them because Doug Hart excels at making photorealistic portraits based off of photographs. And you could tell that these are lit from multiple angles very dramatically, and you can see how that plays into the portraiture that Doug Hart was able to create uh, starting around 91, 92. All right, so now we get into the unadorned artwork. So Electronic Survivor Shot was originally teased as coming for G.I. Joe, but it rolled out as its own non-G.I. Joe product. They decided they wanted to gear it towards a older audience. That's the backstory there. The Electronic Battle Gear set uh, came out with a beautiful Duke painting. Uh, I've got some unadorned artwork for some of the Sonic Fighters. Now, presentation artwork that was usually shown internally ended up being on the catalog. So this is the first time that presentation artwork kind of went public and uh, went out to the masses. So here we are in the 1991 vehicles. This is a beautiful piece of presentation artwork. Absolutely love that. Here's the 1991 vehicles. This is a, another piece of presentation artwork for the battle wagon. There's fewer 1991 vehicles, but still some good stuff. Video games and computer entertainment created two brilliant illustrated pieces, Snake Eyes on the cover and a two page spread featuring Blizzard shooting up some snow serpents. But this was all to feature the uh, 1991 Taxon uh, G.I. Joe, a real American hero video game. So this was a big year for video games that came out in 1991. Later in 1991, Capcom put out another game called G.I. Joe the Atlantis Factor, and this referenced the card art that Doug had created pretty heavily, but it was a new illustration, so that's shown, of course. In 1992, Konomi put out an arcade game. This is more of a comic book style illustration, but I wanted to include it here in the video game section. And we start to talk about the move away from painted artwork towards more comic book style illustration. So this was created by Doug Hart for the 1992 catalog. And as you can see from 1982 
you know, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, they all featured painted artwork front and center. Most times it was unique and original artwork with a couple exceptions. By 1990, they just rolled out the revised logo, which I remember as a kid thinking that was so boring and why were they doing that? And then 1991, it was, in my opinion, even worse. It was kind of this line art from the cartoon and then photographs of the toys, but like stylized, it was just really bad. And then 1992, Doug did this pretty awesome comic book style illustration. I really like that. There was some cross sell stuff going on that was comic book style illustrations. So they were starting to do more and more comic book style, line art style stuff. All right, 1992, getting into the figures. I'm gonna shoot through these because I got a battery warning that I've got about 20% left. There's the recalled roadblock that's very valuable and hard to find. We actually got a card back that had been razored off and we were able to restore that image. I uh, got a really nice scan of that and restored that to make it look like this is a proof card. This is not a proof card. This is just a card that's been razored off and edited to restore it. There was tons of 1992 offers going on, including the gold border Impel cards. Impel came out with a trading card set. Gold border versions were included with figures, as well as combat pay was still rolling and a couple other promotions. Uh, Ninja Viper was available this year, so he's featured there. Again, all file cards for all figures are included in this book. Uh, DEF was only around for a year, unfortunately. They developed a year two, but it didn't make it. This shows all of year one. And this was a, a packet that was sent out to schools all around the country. Really cool stuff. Trying to move the needle on the war on drugs. I got my hands on the original Kodachromes for all these. I was able to buy those at auction from uh, Hakes, and uh, I was really, really happy to get those. And then I just basically composited them into this one big image. So I hope you guys enjoy that two-page spread showing the DEF versus the Evil Headhunters. And shout out to Kevin Watts. You know, he sold them via auction and I bought them, but we're friends now. Uh, Kevin's a great guy and I appreciate him liquidating his collection so that I could get my hands on some of it and, uh, you know, be able to include it in this book. Shout out to Lenny Lee from Lee's Toy Review. That's where I got the Black Dolphin, uh, which was, this is a dolphin, guys, but it was originally designed as a killer whale. And Alan Hassenfeld came in and said, Nope, I want it to be a dolphin because dolphin makes more sense because dolphins are more friendly and they're smarter and they would communicate with humans and it made sense for him to be the sidekick, not a killer whale. And so that's one of the few times where Alan Hassenfeld came in and made a command decision and said, uh, you know, like with a stiff, firm, this is what we're gonna do. And so Vinny DeLivia recounted that story of how they had originally designed a killer whale with killer whale colors and it was a different sculpt than this one. Then they changed it to a dolphin, but somehow China got their signals crossed and they used the killer whale colors on the dolphin sculpt. So that's the story of Finback, the secret origin of Finback. So you get some uh, unadorned artwork. Now all this unadorned artwork was illustrated on white at this point. Uh, Chad's gone in here and added some background details that match the background designs on the card of figures because I, I, I thought that was a, a massive improvement and all the Kickstarter backers voted on this. So thank you guys for weighing in and helping to shape this book. So we wanted to talk about the art of archiving, how nothing is ever set in stone. We're always learning. We're always consulting different materials, gathering our data points and making educated decisions. So electronic supersonic fighters and sonic fighters, what year did they come out? Those kinds of things. What year did Sergeant Slaughter? What year did the fridge? All those things. I've been working in cahoots with Yojo, the folks that were admins there for many, many years as well as Mark Belomo. And we try to get on the same page, compare notes. And when we make changes, uh, certainly present the case to everybody so the community can get clear uh, signals as to what happened when. The uh, Talking Battle Commanders is just yet another example of them including electronics so that they could have a higher price point and make these figures move the needle on the uh, total amount of money needed every year. So you'll start to see less vehicles and that is because the figures were starting to be more profitable and they were able to kind of get the margins that they needed from the figures and that allowed them to dial it back on vehicles just a little bit. So these are internal products uh, made by Hasbro. Kid Dimension was actually part of Hasbro, if I remember correctly. Benny DeLivia ended up working for them years after this. He didn't work for them while this product was here. He was brand manager of G.I. Joe. So this is a beautiful unreleased painting of Duke that was going to be part of the 1995 
Battle Corps Rangers. I was able to get this from a, a gentleman that contacted me through Facebook that found it in a comic book shop of all places. Doug Hart illustrated this for the 1995. This was gonna use the 1993 uh, Duke mold, but it was re uh, repainted in Jungle Fatigues. We'll talk about that more in the unreleased section. So 1993 figures, uh, splash page. And look, we'll just shoot through these. Bad everybody knows there's a ton of Battle Corps stuff. These are laid out a little differently than the other pages, but that's because the sheer volume of them. You don't need to see the logo and Battle Corps on every one of these packages. So made some uh, design and layout decisions here to be able to fit these and not take up too much real estate. We are still including every single file card for all the Battle Corps stuff. We're including all the variant card backs. At this point, they were rolling things out in quarterly waves and adding additional product every quarter. That was a very important marketing strategy that they were coming up with. They obviously are including uh, various uh, pack-ins like these mini comics and poster offers and uh, trading cards from the live action TV commercials. There's a bunch of these. I finally just got a full set, so I'm excited about that. There's one little section that talks about the original artwork that was created for file cards. And this is a piece of unadorned artwork that was created for this tiny little box on Mail Order Deep Six. And so the question remains, out of all of these, how many of these were created in full body paintings like this and just shown in these tiny little insets. If you have any information on this, if you ever come across any of these illustrations, please reach out to me and share like Bobby did with Deep Six right here. All right, so we also wanted to talk about the explosion of mail order figures in 1993 and the transition to just starting to use product photography for these. They were just cranking it out in 1993 and we talk about that because the sales volume per product had fallen but they wanted to keep the income coming in. They had goals, right? And so if your sales per product are declining, you have to crank out more product. And so that was the reality. In 1993, that was the reality. And in 1994, that was the reality. And uh, they didn't scale the team up either because they had the same amount of money coming in, right? So it was a, it was a tough time. Uh, it was a very uh, productive time. They cranked out a bunch of good stuff, but they had to make some sacrifices like original artwork on the back of all the product file cards, right? This is just product photography instead of illustrations, and that's why. All right, so year two of the DEF was actually rolled in to Battle Corps. So every one of these figures that were developed were rolled into Battle Corps. The figures didn't go away, but this branding was never released in the United States. It was, however, mass produced and released overseas. And so I was able to get my hands on specimens from overseas and feature that in the book, along with a couple pieces of unadorned artwork. Shout out to Kevin Watts for the last minute edition of Headhunter Stormtroopers. Absolutely love this illustration. Would not have had it without Kevin Watts. So thank you, buddy. All right, so Mega Marines was the combination of Play-Doh, although it's not called Play-Doh, and G.I. Joe. There was a couple big monsters. These were not inspired by the scale of Ninja Turtles. Uh, Vinny DeLivia actually wished that these were significantly bigger and more detailed to be more scary. Some things don't land the way that you wanted them to. This was an example where Vinny DeLivia was not thrilled with the final product. The original drawings were much more intimidating. It, I think they just got lost in translation in the sculpt and the scale. And so, yeah, I, we're very candid about what things the, the creative team were thrilled with and what things they weren't. Uh, Ninja Force was obviously inspired by Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and uh, not Street Fighter, not Mortal Kombat. Ninja Turtles came first in 89, took a huge chunk out of every toy business. And so Ninja Force was very much a response to that. Now, Street Fighter 2 came along, was an extremely popular video game. Kurt Bazigian noticed that they weren't making any toys and he approached Capcom and was able to strike a deal for pennies on the dollar. They created some really beautiful card art for Street Fighter II, and they created a bunch of figures for them, uh, mostly reused parts, and the vehicles were all reused and redecoed. Now for 1993, here's all the drivers and pilots. They revised the design a little bit to add these explosion call-out bursts. Now I wanted to show these couple illustrations that were shown in Toy Fair catalog in reference to the 1993 Street Fighter II figures. This was recolored, for example, and featured on a package here for Guile. Um, most of the other ones were recolored from the original package art that was created. So just talking about stuff like that, really getting in detail here. Star Brigade, now these Armor Tech figures were developed initially to feature electronics. There's, there's some 
indications that some of these would have LEDs and that kind of stuff. They ended up not including any of that stuff and th these figures kind of suffered for it. It was another example where Vinnie Delivio was not thrilled with the final product, the outcome of this. I, I, I'm personally not a fan either. Uh, like where did his arm go? Did they literally cut his arm off and replace it with a cannon? That's crazy, that's crazy, that's crazy. Um, it's just weird, it's just weird stuff. It doesn't really fit too well with, well with G.I. Joe, a real American hero. Now, they also wanted to ramp up the figure offerings for Star Brigade, and so they took a bunch of figures that had already been made, recolored them, created one package painting, and created this whole subset of Star Brigade fighters. So these are referred to as the Star Brigade fighters, and these are referred to as the Star Brigade armor tech fighters assortment. So these are the armor tech fighters, right? And they got their own unique card art. And these are the Star Brigade fighters, and they're repurposed uh, previously released figure molds. All right, so 1993 vehicles. They got some big stuff out. The Ghost Striker is an awesome vehicle. I really like the Ice Snake. I truly do. Uh, this was a fun uh, play feature that fires this rocket pretty far. The Dino Hunters, <laughs> I know it takes a lot of flack because of the dinosaur, but I think it's an amazing illustration. I absolutely love this illustration. Uh, there's a funny story by Vinny Delivia about how he got sent to the principal's office over the Dino Hunters. I'll let you guys read that. This is the first 12-inch vehicle released since the cancellation of the 12-inch line in 1976. So that's exciting. It's also painted by Bob Lavoy, and I think that's his best illustration for the G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero line. So this is G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero Hall of Fame. This is the 12-inch stuff. All right, so they only got one vehicle out for the Mega Marines, but it's a good one. The Ninja Lightning sold Buku, like tons of units. These two did not sell very well. So these two figures are actually pretty rare and pretty valuable. The armor bot was originally gonna be a terrestrial vehicle, and these were two previously released vehicles. So they took this terrestrial vehicle, gave it more of a space deco, and pushed it out as Star Brigade. Star Brigade was really rushed out the door. It was the internal Hasbro team in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, trying to kind of go up against the Kenner team that was based in Cincinnati and blunt their entry into the market with Star Wars toys. All right, so Street Fighter II, these are all repurposed uh, vehicles and play sets, you know, with some additions of rocket launchers and that kind of thing. I actually like the deco of the Sonic Boom Tank better than the uh, previous release. So some cool stuff in there, definitely give it a look. Then we get into the 1994 figures. And keep in mind, this 1994 product, it didn't all come out. They had more stuff planned for 1994. In August of 1994, that's when they made the determination, that's when leadership made the determination that they were going to shut down G.I. Joe, a real American hero, and they were going to give it a year to the Cincinnati team to develop what they were gonna do next, which would end up being G.I. Joe Extreme. In the meantime, you know, G.I. Joe, a real American hero would be canceled. Sar Sergeant Savage would kind of hold the fort on, on shelves. All right, so 1994, it, the product may look like it's limited, but there was more in the pipeline that was not released. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. But they did some interesting branding changes here. So we talk about that. Uh, half of these figures were rolled out with these vertical cards, and they had it in the works to do vertical cards for the rest of them. Unfortunately, those got canceled. They were released on dual language cards in Canada, which aren't featured here, because this is a G.I. Joe Real American Hero book that just shows domestic US product. Otherwise, it would be another 700 pages. <laughs> you just can't do it. All right, so we talk about the different card backs, the diff different offers. Uh, the addition of Joe Kubert, the original G.I. Joe, General Joseph Colton, was rolled out and he was highly promoted in 1994 as a pack-in offer, the G.I. Joe Commander figure offer. He was released in a three and three quarter inch scale as well as a 12 inch scale. And the advertising that came out for this was illustrated by Joe Kubert. And that's that was a very conscientious decision on Kirk Bazigian's part to introduce the Joe Kubert art style in advance of Sergeant Savage because Joe Kubert was gonna be responsible for all of that package artwork. Now the Shadow Ninjas also came out in 1994, and this is another example where they released the same card art on multiple figures, but not only that, they painted over previous illustrations of Snake Eyes and Storm Shadow for that, so this was clearly done very quickly. Each one of these was painted over from a previous release as well, but if you look at the Spanish release of the Shadow Ninjas, you can see that Nunchuck, he's been only been painted over where he was featured in the file card right? So he's still got his green and black camo pants, but then he's got his Shadow Ninjas deco on top. 
So this is yet again more evidence that they were painting over paintings and only painting over what they absolutely had to paint over for the intended purpose. So for creating these file cards, they didn't even bother to paint over the legs, but somehow that artwork made it to Spain and went on a full file card. They also cut off half of his nunchuck and uh, you know, the Spanish, see, see the nunchuck here, how it wraps around and goes up that way? That was cut off here and whoever's art directing, you know, for the Spanish product, they just didn't even know. So anyway, painting over painting, saving time, really an under pressure by 1994. The manimals were fully developed and ready to roll out. They were canceled last minute. They were shown in the Toy Fair catalog. Here's the original prototype that was mailed to me by the son of the inventor that created this concept. So thank you once again uh, to everybody that has ever contributed anything to 3D Joe's. All that knowledge and all these assets this book didn't happen overnight. You know, we started 3D Joe's in 2012. That's 11 years ago. We've been working on these books since 2015. And everybody that's believed in 3D Joe's and contributed information and assets over time, you guys have made this book what it is. So thank you. And also thank you, of course, to all you backers that gave me the financial wherewithal to spend half a million dollars on a book. So this is Ron Rudat's line art from 1992. It's amazing to see how Ron Rudat's illustrative style really evolved. It's just so intricate here. You compare this to his ideation from the early 80s, and he's just growing exponentially as an illustrator. These are just absolutely beautiful comic book style illustrations. This is the Cobra Commander design. This is the what would grow into being Cobra Black Star. All these figures that were humanoid for 1994 were designed by Ron. If it's an original and it's a human, it was designed by Ron. So I'll try to quickly nail it. Effects, Space Shot, Cobra Commander, Sci-Fi, Cobra Black Star, and Duke. All of those designs were done by Ron Rudat in December of 1992, and they came out as these Star Brigade figures. So shout out to Ron Rudat from, he was there from the beginning to the end of A Real American Hero. So I did want to call out the Power Fighters and how they used product photography here, but I wanted to show their file cards because we've showed every other file card. There was no illustrations on the boxes for the Power Fighters, so you won't see that actual product. You don't need to. 30th anniversary, these were recreated. Doug Hart recalled recreating those because the original source material was not available. The General Joseph Colton figure was also released during the convention as a Green Beret. This is a three and three quarter inch product, but in a 12 inch style box. And this fighter pilot was, again, three and three quarter inch. You can see the figure right there in a 12 inch style box. So 1994 vehicles, there wasn't a tremendous amount of vehicles released this year. But keep in mind that 1993, they, re they released several large vehicles late in the season. Keep in mind all the 1993 content would have still been on shelves. And then this was added in the middle of the year, uh, as, as can be extrapolated by the new vertical logo stuff. I'd say late spring, early summer. And then again, the line was canceled by August of 1994. There was a bunch of stuff that was unreleased though. So we're gonna dig in on that. We're gonna talk about that. The killer whale was gonna be repurposed as the Sea Wolf. The transportable tactical battle platform was gonna be re-released as the Battle Station Portable Arctic Defense Platform. Bob Lavoy painted this one, Doug Hart painted this one. Now, there was a ton of figures in the pipeline. Frostbite, Baroness, Dr. Mindbender, Duke, Payload, War Dog, and you can read all about those guys. There was two versions of the Baroness, one in black and one in blue and red, and we do believe that both of those are going to be released. Road Pig was going to be one of the Ninja Commandos. They were going to do the Battle Corps Rangers, and this was in response to a lawsuit that actually came from Lennard. Can you imagine the gall of those people who had been knocking off G.I. Joe for a decade, and they got offended that G.I. Joe used the word Battle Corps when their line was called the Corps. So they changed the name to Battle Corps Rangers, and these were gonna be some of the key figures and vehicles that were gonna be released as part of that lineup. Uh, Shipwreck, Bulldozer, Flint. You can see several of the vehicles, the Striker XS1, which is kind of like an all striker with a net launcher, and these four guns all moved at the same time, like in unison, pretty cool. Vortex XS2 and the Eel. And Vinny DeLevia shared that these vehicles were actually all gonna be produced overseas, and that was gonna be a big change for Hasbro, because as I had mentioned, all the vehicles from 82 to 94 were produced in the United States, with the exceptions of the higher detail paint apps uh, for Python Patrol and Tiger Force that were produced in Brazil. 
Ninja Commandos, those are very popular because they were gonna roll out in late 1994. So this is an example of late 1994 product. So you can't look at the 1994 offerings and say, oh, they were falling off. Well, no, they were kind of cut short. So the Ninja Commandos were all gonna come out in 1994. Star Brigade replicators were very early on in production and uh, candidly, not super great, uh, but the illustrations are absolutely great. So we feature those. And then an extreme decision was made to hand the brand over to the team from Cincinnati. And that resulted in G.I. Joe Extreme. All right, so uh, just a little bit lightning in the bottle. Uh, wanted to talk about how everybody that I interviewed felt like they were part of something special because they were. Uh, dedication to my father uh, without, his, without his values and his example, uh, his work ethic, this wouldn't have happened. He did 28 years in the United States Army, and then he did 20 years in Moore County Public Schools. He's getting dual retirement. He's getting VA benefits. He's getting disability benefits because this man did nothing but work throughout his whole life. And so he uh, instilled that in myself and my brother. My brother's a lieutenant colonel uh, right now, active. So thank you to my father uh, for kind of shaping me into the man that I am. And uh, th so that's the dedication for him. You can see him from a young man going through jump school. That's my grandfather pinning on the captain's bars to my father during Vietnam. Uh, this is my father in Vietnam as well. This is me sitting on his, laps play his lap playing with some toys. This is him in El Salvador after they captured some guns. Uh, this is him in Fort Bragg just wearing his uh, kind of Lieutenant Falcon attire. This is my uncle who was also in the military, served in Vietnam. My father, my brother, and I. Uh, last big get together for the Rakasans. And uh, yeah, so shout out to my dad. I love you. And so the last double gatefold spread, you grab these two little arrows, peel them apart, and it is all international artwork. And let this be a teaser of what we might do next because I've already got 50 gigabytes worth of international artwork gathered. And I'm sure there's another, what, terabytes and terabytes of international artwork out there to gather. Uh, obviously I would need to do interviews and, and research and that kind of stuff too. So that would be a ways off, but what do you guys think? Should I do it? Let's do it. All right. So anyway, uh, thank you to the collaborative Kickstarter backers. All of your credits are there. So those of you that replied through Kickstarter, um, yeah, your name is there. So just a little teaser about a direction we might take it next, the international artwork of G.I. Joe. We've got a couple working titles, but that could be fun. And then again, I already referenced this, but the closing of the book is the final end sheet, which shows why this stuff matters, why the art of G.I. Joe, a real American hero, is so special to all of us. So thank you to those of you that contributed photos. Uh, shout out to Chad Huckle. That's him and his comic books right there. Chad, we did it. We did it, man. So this is coming. Uh, this is the final product, guys. It was 81, I was trying to leave the war behind Looking for peace and a place I could store my mind In the forest ponds of the high Sierras Of course, what we should find